Euro steps, high cast, man. Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro stepping on the fast break. Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps, Euro steps. Gentlemen, gentlemen, you're listening to Euro Step Podcast. We're coming to you from Oakland, California. We're actually coming to you from the House of Champions. That's right. We're in the. Uh, Golden State Warriors practice facility in their main office. I have a very, very special guest here with me, with me today, a Stanford gentleman. Um, he was also my general manager in my, my early days in the D-League, North, North Dakota, years ago, it feels like. And uh, now he's the assistant GM for the Golden State Warriors. Please give a nice Euro step welcome for my man, Kurt Lake of Kurt, what's going on, bro? What's up, man? Hey, man, I'm chilling, man. I'm chilling, man. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back in the Bay, man. I miss that Bay breeze. <laughs> it's good to have you back, man. Yeah, hey, this is the only place where you need a hoodie in August. <laughs> <laughs> the only place, man. So it's the Euro Step podcast. I always ask a Euro Step question now. I want you to compare yourself to the other GMs in the league, okay? Now, where... Could we put your Euro step? We had to like classify, so let's just say, like, as far as like the teams in the league, you know what I'm saying? Would, would your Euro step compared to other GMs, would we put it on the Golden State Warriors of last year or the Brooklyn Nets of last year? Ooh. Well, good news is I'm a lot younger. Okay. Most of those guys. That's true. That's That's so true. I've got that Give advantage. Give that credit. I, I don't know how many more, how many of them can even do a Euro step anymore. Although, to be honest, I'm not sure how well I can do one anymore. I, I don't really have like changes of speed anymore. Okay. I only have like one speed. So gotcha. your step is only so helpful. All right. So once you get going, you ain't stopping. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a little hard for me to stop these days. <laughs> no, that's funny, man. One thing I always respected about you, just going back to our Stanford days, is uh, you used to always come to the open gym. And, uh, I used to have like a, I used to have a presence in the open gym. I used to, some days I just come in there like, yo, I'm just talking trash all day or whatever it was. And at the time, you know, it's probably the best scoring guard, you know what I'm saying, on the team. But every time you were in the open gym, I would look up, you would be guarding me, man. And I always have respect for you because, you know, not being on the team, you know, sometimes you come to an open gym and stuff like that. You're like, all right, you know, maybe I'll go guard, you know, this guy. But, you know, I always seen that grit in you in that fight, man. And, you know, you weren't no, you know, you weren't, you weren't a cone out there. You know what I'm saying? Like, you would always make me work, man. So, you know, you always had that toughness about you, like, playing basketball. I appreciate that. No, I, you know what, I, I've always thought that's more fun. Mm-hmm. Like, to really push yourself. And I, I'll be the first to admit, like, I'm not the most athletic dude. Um, right. But I, I enjoy playing defense, and I always got up more for the best players. Like, right. guarding guys like you. Garden Mitch Johnson, mm-hmm. Garden Landry Fields, mm-hmm. which is like totally unfair for me because right. the size difference. But like that was more fun. Right. And guard someone else and I get up for that and I, I enjoy it. I still try to do that when we play. We play a lot of pickups still. Yeah. My goal is to try to guard, you know, whoever played in the NBA. Yeah, I bet these open gyms now are, are a little a little better than the Stanford ones <laughs> right now. I mean, you you dealing with some I'm sure some Hall of Famers come across those lines. Well, you or... know, we had a good open gym in, in Summer League in Vegas where I know I saw you briefly. Right. Um, we have some pretty legendary pickup games. We actually had a full Stanford Open gym one day, it felt like. We had uh, Landry came out. Okay. Drew Schiller was there. Uh, Grant Lifton, who I know is not technically a Stanford guy. Hey, he's from that other school. Hey, but we'll, we'll bring him in. We'll bring him in. You know what I'm saying? He it was, out. He's Stanford it, it, out. Exactly. No, it was great. It was great because it kind of it gave me that old feeling of, of being in those Stanford Open gyms. Right, right. Now, how, now who who looked the best? Like, outside of Landry, who looked the best in there? Like, out of Drew, Grant. Well, yeah, you know, Drew, Drew's going to love hearing this, okay. um, but, you know, he hit a couple shots early. He claims he hadn't played basketball in, like, six months. He lied. But he comes in, he drills, like, three NBA threes in a row, but um, I've given him a, a lot of crap for this already. I shook him pretty bad. Okay. And lit up his loot shoe actually ripped. We he fell over. For me. For we me. don't have the tape for unless me. Grant got tape. it, but um, <laughs> it... I just, that's my shout out to Drew Schiller. All he right. knows I've already made fun of him for this. I've told everybody, but one more time. Shook him, his shoe literally ripped, and he fell. Oh man, he's getting tagged when this yes. comes out. He's getting yeah. tagged when this comes out, man. I can't, I can't wait, man. But all right, now there's a rumor going around in uh, in the Stanford area. Now I need you to verify if this is true or not. Okay, so I heard this a long time ago. So they said like a long time ago, your dad was looking for a house, and uh, let's just call it like a gray house. One of the bodies gray house, they were selling the gray house, so he bought the house next door. And then I heard that the, uh, or he bought the house next door and he built it to look like the gray house since the guy wasn't sitting in the gray house. So the guy in the gray house decided to move out 
and then your dad bought the uh, bought the gray house from that guy, and they combined the two properties. Is or is not that story true? It's partially true. Partially it's true. It's partially okay. true. He um, he actually he was living in a house um, down the peninsula. He had moved into it, but he really wanted the house next door. Okay. Um, but it was like a spec house. They finished that house, so he actually bought that. He, had, he actually owned two houses next to each other at one okay. point. Okay. And then there was another house next to the new house he was in. Okay. Um, that he just really wanted the land. I think he wanted a garage or something. Okay. Um, so at one point he actually did have all three houses. He eventually got that last one. He actually did have all three houses. Okay. And he's like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm going to be known as the guy who's buying up the street. Right. Uh, so it's, I think, I kind of think that's yeah, what he is yeah, going okay. for. And he got rid of the third one eventually. Okay. All right. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I heard that story a while ago and I was like, wow, I often drive by that house. You know, it saying. sounds like something like that would do. Too. Yeah. yeah. Usually when he <laughs> wants something, he finds a way to get it. One way or another. Hey, there's nothing wrong. He, he, he got the right thing. Exactly. In he got the right thing in this deal. <laughs> But uh, let's go. Let's go back to you. So, for those who don't know, for the listeners that don't know, what what is a general manager's job in the NBA? Ooh, it's it's a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's there's the fun part of the job that everyone sees, which is helping to put the team together, right? And that's recruiting guys, signing guys, negotiating deals, um, scouting, doing draft prep. Mm-hmm. That's that's definitely a fun part of the job, and that's a very very important part of the job. Obviously, that's what we're ultimately graded on. You know, it's binary right. wins and losses. The reality is there's so much else. Um, and Bob Myers, and I talk about this all the time, but like feels like 80% of the job is on basketball at this point. And okay. it's actually shifting more and more that way. There's so much that's um, media driven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you have to make sure you're constantly portraying the right image of the team and, and the players and the staff to, to everyone out there. The fans deserve that. They're the ones who keep this thing right. going, right, economically. Right. And so they deserve that info. And the other part is just management. Um, I think it's, it's a pretty straightforward, almost silly thing to say, but like managing people yeah. all day. Um, teams are big, staffs are getting bigger, bigger coaching staffs, training staffs. There's a lot that goes into those things moving day to day. And mm-hmm. so a lot of it is really just managing people, um, you know, managing a budget, understanding uh, long term planning. So while you want to go out there, you want to build the best team possible for today and try to win, you have all these other things going on in your mind right. that you got to keep track of. I think that's really fun. Yeah, if yeah, it was yeah. just picking players day to day, like I could go to a rec gym and yeah. like, just pick out my four guys and go up against those five guys, yeah. and like that'd be really fun. But that's not what the job is today. It's it's so much more, and I think that's that's really fun. And, and you were there my first foray into it. I mm-hmm. mean, I was pretty much right out of school. Right, right. Um, we were in Dakota. And I think I knew going in. I was pretty prepared. That that's it was going to be a lot more, but I still didn't know. Like, right. I hadn't done it, and. It was really fun to get to learn all stuff. You know, you're hanging with the players and the coaches, and you're making sure things are going through, but you got all these things in the back of your mind that they don't know about. Yeah. Um, that, that are really important to the team continuing to operate. Right. Now, was this something like, what, what did you study in school? Because I don't, you know, you don't have like general manager department right. at Stanford, but what did you study in school at the time? I was uh, STS, STS, Science, okay. Technology, right. and Society. So people who didn't go to Stanford, um, I'm just going to tell them it's triple major. Yeah, it's not okay. it sounds like Yeah, that. right? Science, technology, yeah, and yeah, society. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, actually, it's funny. I actually, I think that that helped me okay. prepare a lot for what I ended up doing. Um, it, it was a very interdisciplinary major, and it was kind of a little fuzzy, a little techy. So I learned kind of both sides of the coin. And I think it was really helpful for what I do now um, because you do learn – how to read situation, how to read people. But you also learn, you know, some things in the economics bucket. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn some things. There's a lot more tech in basketball, obviously mm-hmm. now. Analytics. There's there's math ball. So I, I got enough of a view of different things that I think yeah. it actually transitioned me pretty well. And then my other real major was basketball, of course. Right. right? Of course. Out at the gym every single day. I had starting the club program after mm-hmm. um, after I was done with you guys. So um, that was actually a great great opportunity. Just it's a very minute level. Yeah. Um, but a sense of organizing, dealing with red tape, like yeah. going through Stanford. You never probably had to do this as like a uh, scholarship player, but like going through Stanford bureaucracy to make anything work is not easy. Yeah, I, I always found that at Stanford, man. They, they do things by the book, man. They, yeah. they, they don't they bend, do. they don't budge. No, you know what I'm saying? Not at all. It's, uh, it's funny, man. They don't. They don't, they don't give you like, cars, right? No, nah, nah, yeah. nothing, man. I mean, I was just there the other day and there was like some construction going on and I literally needed to go to the opposite side of the the athletic department where there's like construction and like this lady is telling me oh you gotta go uh you know it's right over there but there's construction 
So you're gonna have to walk way over here. I'm like, okay, but I could kind of, no, 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 no. You're gonna have to go outside, walk all the way around the corner, make two lefts, and then come through the door. And I'm like, yo, lady, there is nothing dangerous <laughs> in that way. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, that's just kind of how they do things there. But you gotta love them, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Uh, yeah, they, don't, they, don't, they don't cut anybody any breaks. But now, with your job here, uh, pre draft is obviously, you know, a big part, at least, you know, for, uh, for fans, you know, that's. That's where we rely on the GMs to, you know, make the, the right decision as far as like self selecting players. Now heading into these, let's just say, okay, when you guys are deciding, okay, who we're going to bring in for pre-draft, what are some of the things that you look at? Let's say, um, you know, maybe even things that may not even show up in the stat sheet. I, I think the first thing, remember, we're, we're bringing guys in is we don't always get the guys we want. Right. Um, you know, it's become harder and harder. Back when I started. We had a lot of draft picks, and they were usually pretty high. Right. Um, so you get who you want yeah. in. You know, now we either don't have draft picks, or if we do, we got one at the end of the first round, or right. maybe one at the end of the second round. Um, and it's hard to convince a player or an agent that you want to take a serious look at them because a they all think they're lottery picks, yeah, yeah. and b like you don't have a draft pick, they don't even know if you're going to take them. Yeah. So it's 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 a little tough these days to get guys in, but we always manage a good group. And I think the things that we look at, especially where we're at, we're not going to get the guys who are ranked mm-hmm. the highest, is to look at what guys do really well. Okay. Um, I think it's really easy to go watch players and see what they do poorly mm-hmm. and forget about what they do really well. Right. And the NBA and professional basketball in general, it's really about having a couple really good skills. Look, there's a couple guys who are so good. We all know who they are. Yeah, like we all see those top guys. They're like can't miss. Like it doesn't matter where they end up. Right. But for most guys, it's about how you fit into a team and how you fit with other personalities and players. And the things we really care about, and we scout heavily, and, and that we test when guys come in here, and we think our skills are basically competitiveness, determination, and IQ. I mean, those are things that aren't maybe always apparent when you're watching film. Mm-hmm. You can try, and there's there's ways to point to those things. Um, there's certain stats that might let you know that, okay, maybe this guy knows a little bit more than appears at first glance. Mm-hmm. Let's take a deeper look. When you get a guy in here and you've got coaches working with them and you can see in a three and three, go, who really wants to win every drill? Okay. Like who yeah. needs to win every drill? Right. And who can pick things up and like, who just has a good feel? You know, you're giving him something maybe he's never seen before. Right. A new offense, how quickly does he pick it up? How quickly does he pick up our defensive uh, concepts? You know, how well does he communicate with other players? To me, those are two really, really important skills, mm-hmm. and, and you can glean those from a workout. Right. You know, how competitive is a guy, and and how, how smart is he? How quick can he think? Okay, and in these same workouts, how do how do pre-draft players like hurt themselves? They come in out of shape. Like you've seen guys come in like, crazy out of shape. Like, come on, dude. yeah, I mean that's never a good look. Right, right. you're you're. <laughs> it's like you're applying for a job, yeah. essentially, right? Your your applicant has applying for a job. That's like coming into a job interview, and you're like in your pajamas. And half asleep, and, and you come in, and they start asking you questions. You're like, man, I don't know anything about this business. Right, right. Like, that's what it's like when a guy comes in out of shape. And, and I get it, everyone's got different bodies, and some guys might be injured. And, mm-hmm. and I get it, there's a difference between game shape and practice shape too. And for a lot of those guys, they haven't, they haven't played a game in three or four months right. at that point, so we give them a little bit of a break. But yeah, if you come in and, and you know you think you've already made it, man, you're in a draft workout. Yeah. That's like again going to a job interview thinking you already have the job. So some guys come in with like egos. Like, yeah. Oh no question. And you can tell like in the meetings, or you can just tell them how they deal with like let's say like a like a somebody out there rebounding or you. Know, so that. here's actually my my biggest test. Okay. Um, and this is for any ballers out there who actually like want us our equipment guy. Okay. Always go to him first because he's the one who interface well with players who they don't know really who he is. And, and he's there to help them. And he's the best. Our guy, Eric House, is mm-hmm. literally the best. Um, but I always ask him, I said, how was this guy to deal with? How was that guy? To deal? And he tells me someone was a diva and picks from the airport or with the gear he gives me. He's like, we're giving you free gear. Right. And we're helping you get set up. And if you're a diva or you're difficult or you're, you know, acting appropriately to like a younger staffer, yeah. like that's a red flag. Um, it really is. So I, that's actually the truth. Is I always go to the equipment guy first. Wow. And I say like, Tell me about those the six guys we got in here. Rank them for me. Not based on basketball. You haven't seen him play right, yet. Right, right. Uh, what do you think of him? His work ethic, his preparedness. You know, what time did he get here for the workout? Where did he go first? Did he ask you for the gear right away and extra socks, <laughs> or did he say, <laughs> "Where's the training room? Right. Like, I want to get, I want to get stretched out." Yeah, right, right. And I think that's that's big. Yeah. For me. No, I, I can definitely see that. It's funny, man. When I, I'm thinking back to you know my pre draft days and stuff like that, I, I I went to a few workouts with guys. 
it's crazy out of shape. And like in, in Denver, okay, I understand that's a little altitude, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, some of these other places, it's like, come on, bro. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What have you been doing? Like, this is yeah. essentially an opportunity of a lifetime, man. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're showing up out of shape. It's like, what have you been doing since March? I mean, you think about this since halfway through the college right. season. And uh, I just always think that it's just, it's so unacceptable for these young guys. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess, you know, you got the wrong advice, wrong people when you're here, you know, and then you're walking around with that ego. Yeah, you know saying? you're, you're more worried about making money than you are playing basketball. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, you know, that money don't come to you put pen to paper, man. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't come to you put pen to paper. So, on the other side of things, how do you guys go about, let's say, selecting, like, free agents or, like, overseas guys? Like, you guys usually have, like, a mini camp. You guys still doing that? We, we used to have a lot of mini camps. Mm-hmm. We, I mean... <laughs> It's so like awkward to put it this way, but like we don't really have time for it anymore because okay. we're kind of going deep in the playoffs. Right, right. Um, so it's a good problem to have. We, when we were bad, we had a lot more mini games. Yeah. We just don't have as much time for them anymore. But we're the the place we're at with our team. Finding those under the radar and diamond in the rough guys mm-hmm. is huge um, because we have we have a couple absolute superstars, and we know we're going to continue to build around those cool. guys. Just a couple. Just okay. Maybe, hey, maybe, hey, 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 hey. Maybe you don't like have to be five. modest here. You don't have to be modest here. No, we, we got a great core. Right. We got an unbelievable core, and they're so easy to fit around too. Okay. Like it's so if you know how to play basketball at all, you're going to look good with these guys. Mm-hmm. And so our goal is find guys who have that drive, and they they might be um, you know land of misfit toys a little bit. Right. Maybe there's something. There's a reason why you know Team X to why, why you haven't fit in the NBA yet because you're too short or mm-hmm. You know, you don't look the part, mm-hmm. or you got a funny looking jump, or whatever. But if you can do one or two things really well, these guys will amplify that, and you'll fit. Right. And I think we've been pretty fortunate. We've we brought guys in to compete for spots, and each of the last few years, we've had guys make the team, mm-hmm. and have been big contributors on our on our squad. Right. Um, like Ian Clark is a great example. Yeah, of that. He yeah. came to a summer league with us four years ago, I think, mm-hmm. and I really liked him. You know, I just got him. But he was one of those guys undersized. Um, some people weren't sure if he was going to be able to get a shot off in the NBA, mm-hmm. um, weren't sure if he was athletic enough, but like we loved his intelligence and his, his competitive drive and he was awesome in summer league. We actually lost him, right, yeah, yeah. Keep him right? right? But you know, we get that two years later, he comes back to camp and mm-hmm. he's free agent and might have to go overseas. He killed it. Yeah. He absolutely killed it. He made the team. He won a title. Um, yeah. and you know how he's on the bigger and better things now, yeah. but we got guys like that every year. So when we're, you ask me, what are we looking for guys? Just someone who fits our culture right. and and can provide us something. Right. Because we don't need guys to do the heavy lifting. Mm-hmm. We've got enough guys to do that. Yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, I'm right. it takes me back to when uh, I remember we used to have a lot of conversations at school with uh, Mitch's dad, John Johnson, uh, passed away. But he, uh, you know, he's NBA champ back in the day, played had many years in the league with the Sonics. Um, and he used to always say, like, in the NBA, like, you have to to get into the NBA these days. He said, back in the day, like, you had to be good at everything. You had to be able to shoot the mid-range, be able to pass the ball, and things like that. He's like, now you just have to have a weapon. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, what is your weapon? And then whatever you do well, just go in there and do it well. As opposed, like you said, like, you know, don't worry about your weaknesses. You know what I mean? Just do what you do well. But I want to know. What the what kind of what kind of things go on in that war room on draft day? Like what kind of what kind of things are going out there? You know what are what is everybody talking about as far as like okay we're going to decide on this player? Especially you guys are at the end of the draft, so you know what I mean I mean you could pick like a guy that maybe was projected second round or maybe some guy that slipped you know all the way. What are some uh, what are some crazy things like going around in that uh, in that war room? So for me the the most fun part about draft is actually a whole week. Ahead of the draft. I love draft day. Don't get me wrong. It's right. so exciting. That's when things happen and it's all in real time. Um, but that whole week before is when we have all our discussions and we make our board and we're making mm-hmm. calls. We're trying to figure out where someone might go. Um, you're trying to figure out some background information. Maybe at the last second you find out like this dude, you do not want to touch him. Mm-hmm. Or you find out like this is the most unbelievable guy of all time. We've had five people call us to tell us this is the hardest ring. So you find out all these things, you make your board, and then you get in that war room and things change. Like yeah. there's always one guy who gets picked way ahead of where you think, right. or there's a trade that happens that throws off everything. Right. Um, or there's last minute information that a guy might have an injury and he starts to drop. For us, usually at the that 30 pick range mm-hmm. is who you thought was going to be there is almost never there. Okay. Um, and so you always have a surprise. You just got to be prepared for what those surprises. You can never truly be prepared, but try to be prepared for every possible scenario. 
And I think the most fun thing about that worm is just figuring that stuff out in real time. Mm-hmm. And you're getting calls sometimes, someone trying to move up or move back, and you got to make decisions quick. You could have prepared as much as you want and said, well, we'd like to move up or we'd like to move back. Right. We're willing to do this, we'll do that. But you never know what someone's going to offer you. Yeah. And then you got to make a quick decision. I think that's fun. Right. To me, that's like being back on the basketball court. Right. And you know, you got to make a split decision. You come around a pick and roll or something, you're going to make a split decision. Am I pulling up? Am I going to try to like shoot this thing yeah, through the gap yeah, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. you know, or am I going to pull it back out? You got all these decisions to make. And I like that. Yeah. I think that's really fun. Um, and it, the other part, it lasts for like six hours. You know, you yeah. go from like on the West Coast, 4 p.m. all the way to 10. Because after the draft, you're still trying to fill out your summer league roster. You're trying to get undrafted right, guys. Right, right. Um, there, there's all that stuff to do after the draft. So it's it's a fun day. You, you're wired like yeah. for a good 24 hours, and then you're just cooked after. Yeah, I imagine it's, it's kind of like the stock market and stuff. But, yeah. you know, is there ever like a time where, you know, okay, you guys are trying to – everybody's on the fence about, like, let's say, like a couple guys and, you know – Somebody blurts out and brings up, oh, he's mean to the equipment manager, or oh, he's a steak with a salad fork. Like, you know what I'm saying? Anybody ever throw out, like, things like that? That's a like we, that? we try to get that done the week before. I mean, okay. if, our rule is basically if you got something to say about a guy yeah. and you know about it, make sure you say it. Right. Leading up, because we, we don't want to be changing our draft board mm. as the draft is going on. Mm. You know, we might have a just maybe it was a tie between two guys, and, and we might want to bring Steve Curran to talk to him about yeah. the type of player and maybe we'll try to break a tie that way. But you kind of want to have your draft board more or less set. Gotcha. What you don't want to do is all of a sudden night of draft, your pick comes up. It's like, well, actually I like this guy more. Yeah. Like that just throws the whole yeah. room into this <laughs> array. <laughs> nah, I get you. I get you. So how do you think the, uh, the league is going to change now with these two way contracts? And how is that in turn going to affect the G league? Cause correct me if I'm wrong. So with the two way contracts, you know, these guys, you know, they're a lot of a certain amount of days in the NBA. But they're going to spend most of the time in the G League. And then let's say you got a drafted rookie who's not going to play much. You can send him down to the G League team as well. So, essentially, let's say you could possibly, depending on the team, you could possibly send, what, four guys down? So it's yeah, I, I mean, I think it's great. Mm-hmm. I think it's phenomenal. Um, I started working in the D League it was seven years ago now, mm-hmm. um, that first year. And it's changed a ton. But I, I love where it's gone. I think we still have a ways to go. Yeah. But it's so much more of a true minor league system now, yeah. especially with these two-way contracts that it ever was before. Um, you know, I don't know if you remember, but like my speech to guys when when they came to our new league team at the time, Dakota, was the perfect reality is all 10 of you guys. And remember, you were all free agents at the mm-hmm. time, right? So it's very different. All 10 of you guys are free agents. My perfect situation is we win every single game. All 10 of you guys get called up to the NBA and all to the Warriors. Right. And the reality is that's not possible. We don't have 10 roster spots. That'd be really bad if we had to call 10 guys up from the D-League and something went horribly wrong. Um, But that's what we shoot for, right? We shoot for that that perfection. And I think that gives everybody a little bit of of an edge to continue to want to work and get better. And the reality is one of you might get called up. Two of you might get called up. And it might not be the Warriors. It might be somewhere else. And that happened to us. We we lost guys to different teams. And then there's other guys. Like, I think, um, I believe I had to trade you. Right? To four, or did you leave? No, I left for Italy. You left for Italy. I'm thinking of next year. Yeah, next yeah, year yeah. we traded you. Yeah. Yeah, when I came back and then I asked the There we go. Yeah. So, but that's another part of it too is like it's not just about the NBA. Yeah. Sometimes it's about what you can do for someone's future. Right. Regardless. And um, you want to set everyone up. But what I think is great now is you have a little more protection over mm-hmm. guys. And that gives you a little bit better chance to build a true program. Because mm-hmm. I think as a player, if you're a free agent, you obviously want to get to the NBA as quick as possible. Right. Um, even if you like the D League, and not everyone does playing it, but some guys really like it. Even if you have your goal is to get to the NBA. Yeah. And it's it's hard sometimes to manage. You see your friend from another team's getting called up, and you're like, why aren't we getting called up? Um, maybe I'm better than him. Mm-hmm. And it, it can be kind of tough. Um, I think what's to do a development plan, we just don't know. You don't know how long guys are going to be there. Yeah. Um, and we, we had it happen. You know, Dwayne Dedman mm-hmm. is an example, is a guy we loved. And he was terrific. He got so much better by leaps and bounds every single day with us. And we lost him because we didn't have his rights. Right. And, you know, I'm so happy for Dwayne. He's had a great career. He went to Orlando, had a good couple of years. Uh, we actually tried to get him back. He went to the Spurs, had a great year. And uh, now he's going to Atlanta. But it can be really hard to put all that effort into helping a guy get ready and yeah. not be able to continue that development with him. So I think that's the best part about the two ways right. is continued development. Now, it's still about halfway because, like you said, 
you got your two two way guys, and then you might have a, a young guy who's on affiliate, and then you still have half the roster are just you now G League players. Yeah. And that's always a tough dynamic as management coach. Um, I know it's not easy as a player. Yeah. Uh, to know that you know some guys are earmarked for their development's more important than mine. That's yeah. not an easy thing to go through. Yeah. But one thing also I'm thinking about just now is how's that going to affect call ups? Because now you got these, you know what I mean? You got, let's just say it's like a ladder. Everybody's got a seat. You know, at the table, a guy goes down, chances are maybe you got like a, like let's say a guard goes down and you got one of your two way players as a guard. Obviously, he moves up the ladder, you know what I'm saying? There's not, I feel like with this two way thing, it might hurt the G League a little bit in the sense of in the sense of call up unless I mean the guy's just putting in crazy work, then obviously you're gonna call him up. But what do you how do you think that's gonna affect call ups so during this first year at least? Yeah, I think look, we don't really know. Yeah. The first year we never had it happen. I, I do think there's more jobs, mm-hmm. which is, is helpful. Because instead of you have fifteen man roster and then two two way spots. Right. So realize yeah. some guys might not get called to a bit, might get called to a two way. Oh, oh, they can do college as two-way. Yeah, oh, so you okay. can actually okay. make a two-way contract into an NBA contract. Oh, okay. okay. So what I think will happen is either you got a guy you like on your two-way system, gotcha. and there's a guy killing the G League, and he's ready, so you move him up um, into your 15th roster spot. Or if the two-way guy's killing it, you move him to the 15th roster spot, you got a new two-way spot. So I actually think it'll help guys um, because anytime someone moves up, there's a new two-way spot. Teams will be a little more open to adding someone on a two-way contract than an NBA roster spot. Um, so I think just there's more potential jobs. I think that's that's going to be good for the league. Um, I think more than anything, we just want the level of competition to continue to rise. We want more guys to continue to come and play in the G League right. than go overseas. And I think you as a player would probably love that. Yeah, yeah of um, Because I'm sure you love your overseas, everything you've done overseas. You're also from California, yeah, yeah, and it's California. probably nice. Like wife, yeah, you'd probably love to like, yeah, be in of California. course. I mean, it'd be good. I mean, be in the U.S. for a little. And bit. that's what I think. I think if the the moment the G League like starts extending those salaries, you know what I'm saying, and start getting them, you know, closer to the uh, you know hundred thousand dollar range, you know what I'm saying, because it will be taxed. Uh, I think you're going to keep a lot of guys home. Yeah. It's going to be the second best league in the world by far. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, but. That all remains to be seen. You know. All remains to be seen. Like I said, we've got a long way to go, but I'm excited. Yeah. It's been a fun seven years. I can't wait to see the next five. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's, let's go back upstairs. Because when I was in the D League, we saw it's called the NBA upstairs. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They sent the good guy. I remember they used to send players down, and then our coach used to say, well, he was that good. He'd be upstairs right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, we're going to go back upstairs now. Pops acquired the team in 2010. You must have been crazy excited. Um, now... When that happened, was the goal, like you look at the team now and from when, you know, you acquired the team in 2010, was the goal to have this many shooters, you know what I'm saying? It, what was, do you remember what the plan was as far as constructing the team moving forward? Because you guys had pieces, but, you know, a lot of guys came and went since then. Uh, what was the goal as far as reaching to this level of success now? I've talked about this before. I was with him when we actually got the team and it was, it was a really cool moment. And he, he asked me right then, he's like, do you want to work for the team? And I actually said no. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, I, I said no at first. I was like, I don't I want to do my own thing. I don't want to work for you. And he's uh, like, right. really? Like, this is your favorite sport, your dream job, right. like, your favorite team. And I was like, yeah, I just I want to do something else. Okay. And over two months, he, he wore me down. That's, and, a, that's a very Stanford response. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I well, like, I wanted to go start, like, a billion-dollar company. Of course. That's, yeah, what I mean. that's what I wanted to do. It was a very Stanford response. Like, at first, I'm like, why would you say that? And then I'm like, you know what? At Stanford, like, you know, guys are into everything. I mean, it's just so many guys, like, Instagram, Snapchat, everything comes from there. Yeah. So I can see that. Okay. No, so I, it, it's great, actually. I, this ended up being an unbelievable startup. The way we viewed it, it became a really cool startup. So I got the best of both worlds. But... I think when we took over the team, we both had an idea. We'd always talked about what we liked in basketball. And we were huge basketball fans, huge Stanford basketball fans, college mm-hmm. basketball fans, NBA fans. And we had an idea of what we wanted. I think we also were aware that we didn't know everything mm-hmm. and that things change. Right. You know, I think what was interesting for me growing up was my dad had sort of a unique basketball history. He, he grew up in Massachusetts in the 50s and 60s. With the Celtics, mm-hmm. and you know, loved that that defensive, yeah. the lost passing, just do everything you can with Bill mm-hmm. Russell. He moved to Anaheim when he was thirteen, and so he kind of was in the middle of it, L.A. Boston thing, yeah. and was actually in the eighties was in L.A. 
And so he's there for Showtime. Mm-hmm. Um, and he loved Showtime. So you have this unbelievable dichotomy for him growing up between defensive oriented, grinded out Celtics basketball and Showtime. Right. And I think that informed a lot of his view of basketball. And then there's there's the whole, you know, growing up in the, the late 90s in Sanford, early 2000s, when Monty was a coach and mm-hmm. team was unbelievable. It was very team-oriented, though, right. system basketball. So he, he, I think, took, and this is how he is as a person, he took the best parts of everything that he saw. Okay. And he said, here's my vision. We're going to have a team that plays the right way, that plays like a team, that is really fun to watch. Um, and I want people to enjoy playing the game. And... I want to beat everybody, so we need good players. Mm-hmm. So our first thing, let's go find a star. We're really lucky. That star already existed okay. here, right? right? Steph came in a year before we were here, and I think at the time, I'll be first to admit, no one knew how good he was. Mm-hmm. Um, he was really interesting. He was unique, but um, no one really knew it. When you got here, you realized how good he was. Yeah. He, he's a unique person. His work ethic, his leadership, and then just the ability to shoot from anywhere, mm-hmm. like in, in any sense. Um, but... When we drafted our first draft was Clay Thompson, and he kept saying he believed that Clay wasn't that different from Steph in the sense that he could really shoot in the game. It was just kind of easy for him, mm-hmm. um, and he had this mentality that it fit what we wanted. And we just kept collecting guys that we thought had unique skill sets, and um, we wanted guys that were, like I said, competitive and high IQ. And it ended up that the first two guys were unbelievable shooters. And so, to a sense, we kind of lucked into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there was a reason we chose those guys, or at least Clay. Um, and we could also see that the, the wave was starting to happen. Um, right. Three point shooting was becoming more valuable. The funny thing is, I, I tell people this all the time. When I was growing up, I I used to always ask coaches, if I'm open from three, why don't I just shoot it? Yeah. Like, and the response you always got, I'm sure you got us all the time, was we can work it around and get a better yeah. shot. <laughs> Right, well, and I'm like, one that's early, like, and I was like, open, open. yeah, I was like, but it's open. Like, I got practice these shots, and this is worth more. Like, right. it's worth three. Right. 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 So, right. if I'm wide open, I should shoot. So, um, Chris Weems, former Stanford grad, my high school coach, we used to joke with us. We had a, a zone def- a zone offense mm-hmm. called it gaps. To this day, I couldn't tell you how gaps worked because I would just dribble up against the two three zone as a point guard, and mm-hmm. I would just I'd get a little off center, and then I'd come and I'd fake a pass, and the guy would move, and I'd sit there at the top of the key, wide open from three, and I'm like. Fine, I'm going to shoot this. Right. Hey, in high school basketball, 35 second shot clock. So it was like 28 on the clock. And he's been like, "You can get that shot anytime." I was like, "Yeah, but it's a good shot." So we always used to joke about gaps. Yeah. <laughs> so we used to joke about gaps. It was a play I just dribbled up and shot the ball. Right. Um, but no, so that, like you know that started to form our thinking. We got a guy. He's like Steph or Clay. That's that good shoot. You want them shooting that shot, whether it's early shot clock, late shot right. clock. Right. They're open. Let it fly. Right. Um, so this thing, you know, we learned over time and kind of snowballed. And, here we are today. We got yeah. a bunch of guys who can shoot the yeah. defense, dribble pass. I think the special thing about your group is like, you know, for for those of us that are able to only watch it, you know, from the, from the television, we can see that it's a fun group of guys. Yeah. But what what I think people don't see is how hard these guys work. Can you mm-hmm. speak to that? Like as far as like the work ethic yeah. of these guys. I mean, I, I remember when uh, the year I was in Dakota, I went to training camp with OKC and I remember Every day at that training camp, KD and Russ were the first ones in the gym. Every day getting shots up. And I'm pretty sure, you know, he's, he's brought that same type of uh, mentality and work ethic here. Well, you know that as a basketball player. Your best player sets the tone. Mm-hmm. Right? And if your best player is your hardest worker, it sets the tone for everybody else. Right. Um, for us, Steph was that guy from the start. Um, he has unreal work ethic. Right. And it's not just about working hard, right? It's about working smart too. Like he comes out here and, and he sweats. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he does. He works hard. He does unbelievable things. And he's all those crazy shots he hits in the game. Unbelievable floaters, lefty spin, turnaround. He practices all that stuff. Okay. Um, but I think what's crazy, he never talks about it. Okay. He's never out there telling you how hard he's working. He just does his job. And he expects you to work too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's great. And, and guys like Clay, they Clay once told me a thing that makes him happiest in the world is shooting a basketball. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty easy for him to come out here because that's like what he does for fun is come out and shoot. Right, right. Um, but, you know, Clay even, I don't know if he knew when he first came to the NBA how hard you have to work. Yeah. But he didn't mind it. He right. enjoyed it. And he came out uh, summer after his rookie year and he was here all summer working every day on defense. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of guys don't do that. You know, working on defense positioning and slides and how to run your body. All 
that stuff, and then you get a guy like Draymond Green who comes in, and I think everyone can see how hard he plays. That guy is, first of all, he's like a genius. I mean, he remembers everything. He thinks so quickly, but okay. he also he works on the little things. Yeah. Um, every year he adds something new to his game. And when you got guys like that, now we have Kevin too, mm-hmm. and Andre and Sean. It just it makes it so easy for everyone else to fall in line and work mm-hmm. hard. Um, and the best part, and you touched on this, is that they have fun while they do it. Yeah. I mean, there's shooting contests that like Steph and Clay do, and now KD does. Yeah. That's that's a big part of it. Um, you know, playing games, you get to practice. Steve does something every practice where he has guys shoot half court shots. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And it becomes a fun little game. Right. And the staff gets into it. Okay. The train staff gets into it. I think that's an important part of it. Work hard, work smart, but have fun while you work. Right. It makes it a little more sustainable. Definitely, man. And, uh, I, I can see it, and I think that's dope that they, they get the staff involved because when you have the when the whole unit, the whole organization is together, you have success. But I know we gotta get out of here. I just want to wrap up. It's my last little thing. It's called Heat Check. It's a game. I just need to know. Uh, well, I've done it differently in the past. We're gonna do a Golden State Warriors edition. So I'm gonna ask uh, who's the best of the best. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask who's the best of whatever. And you're just gonna give me a player on the Golden State Warriors team. Okay. okay? All right. So we're gonna start it off like this. Best comedian. Ooh, best comedian. I, <laughs> I'm going to go with Clay. Okay. Um, it's a little bit unorthodox. I just think Clay's hilarious. Okay. Sometimes unintentionally. Yeah. No, but I'm, I'm going with Clay. He makes me laugh every single day. Clay is funny, man. I need to get him on. Clay is funny. All right. Best actor. Best actor, Andre Iguodala. Okay. Andre Iguodala. Okay. What about a best rapper? Best rapper. Who would be the best rapper? Ooh, um, you know, we do this, the rookies, I'm sure you know, do this, like, rookie mm-hmm. hazing every year, they got to sing, and I'm trying to remember who it was a couple years, I want to say it was Ian Clark who came out and did something pretty good, Mac, James McAdoo, too, okay. um, I can't remember what they're song they were singing rapping, they were rapping, because okay. you were supposed to yeah, sing, but they, 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 rap. they rap, I think it was those two, I could be wrong, but okay. I'm pretty sure those two were really well, good, if I remember, yeah. Uh, anybody yeah. sing, any, any best singers on the team? Oh, man, they probably think they're all really good singers. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Festus used to think he was a great singer okay. when he was here. <laughs> All right. What about best dancer? Best dancer? I mean, I, I'm a Steph's got some moves. Yeah, you know, we see that. Oh, yeah, he got yeah, a little he's shimmy. Got a little shimmy. shimmy. I, know, I know Draymond's going to say he's the best dancer. Okay. Right. I know that. But uh, I maybe I'll go with Steph because he's got that shimmy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Most likely to survive in the woods? Uh, it's either Draymond or David West. Those are two, if it was like a zombie apocalypse or anything, those are the two I'm taking. They'll get you out of any scenario. Whether they know how to do anything, they'll figure it out. They'll survive. All right. Most likely, most likely to survive in jail. Well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go... Oh, man, he's not here anymore. I was going to say Mo Spades. Okay. Um, Mo used to come with us when we went to San Quentin to, okay. to play basketball. Right, Mo used right, to come right. and everybody loves Mo, man. Okay. He's like, everybody loves Mo. And <laughs> he would be right. So he up. literally, I've already seen who was most popular. Like, people like Mo. Yeah. And yeah. so I think he'd be, he'd be, he'd be good. Okay. And then uh, the last, oh, what about, uh, okay, most likely to be a superhero who has a heart for humanity? Ooh. You know what? I, I'm going to go with, I, I've used him for a lot of things, but Draymond, okay. because, you know, every superhero, you got to have the good and the bad, right? Yeah. You got to have something that's like your kryptonite. Yeah. And then you've got to, be able to have a big heart. That guy cares so much about every single person. Okay. And um, he's the ultimate team player, too. He'll do every little thing, so I'd probably say him. Okay. Um, but you know who would make a good superhero is Javan McGee. <laughs> he, he'd buy into the whole superhero. Obviously, he'd be shooting three-pointers to yeah. man. So he, he, no, he could basically fly. Uh, you know, he could have man, fun man. with it. Hey, he's shooting threes now. I mean, he could do anything. I don't believe it. <laughs> I don't believe it if he's shooting threes this year. All right, last one. Now, let's just say, for instance... You're in the gym. You're held hostage. Guy's got a gun to you. He's going to kill you. You know what I'm saying? Steph, Katie, and Clay Thompson walk in the gym. The killer. Now, this is a bad guy, right? Let's just say he's from Cal and he's a Cavs fan. So he's going to kill you. But he says, if you if, if one of these guys, you can pick one of these guys to make a 30-footer. Cold turkey, these guys ain't shot a ball all day. Who are you choosing? Oh, man. Your life's on the line. line. Your life's on the Those line. Those three guys would be my top three in the NBA. Okay, to do this. you got to pick one to save your life from 30 feet. You know, Cole Turk. I'm, I'm going to go Clay. Clay. And okay. the reason I'm going to go Clay is because I don't think there is such thing as Cole Turkey with him. Like, I think okay. he's always shooting. He's, he's always warm. And, and here's the other thing. He wouldn't care. 
Like those other dudes, those other dudes, they might they might be like, man, I'm shooting for Kirk's life here. Clay would come out and be like, I'm just shooting a basketball. Like he doesn't care, he doesn't know what's going on. He play probably won't even say that like Yeah. He he probably just comes in, he'll just pick up the ball and like shoot it. You go shoot it. Yeah, he's gonna shoot it anyway. So I'm not really good play. Alright, that's good, man. Back to the superhero. All right, I already got Ninja Turtle socks on, man. I got Ninja Turtle socks. Who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? You know, I think probably Michelangelo. That's okay. that's the easy one. Um when I was growing up, I think I, for some reason, I don't, I don't really even know why, but I think I like Donatello. Okay. Uh, but probably this these days, Michelangelo. Yeah, me yeah. too. Me too, man. But Kirk, I appreciate your time, man. It's been yeah. great, man. Appreciate it. Good to see great. you. It's great to see you as always. Hey, I hope another championship comes your way. I hope so, too. You know, I, I predict that you guys will win in five, and, uh, you know, let's just keep that money in my pocket, man. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks, man. And uh, everybody back home, thanks for watching. Uh, please like, subscribe, and... Uh, Euro steps, podcast, Euro steps, 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 Euro steps,